I'm very looking forward to listening to this talk because my background is as well as research um, and molecular. So our next speaker tonight or today, the last speaker of the day, is the young and talented next generation scientist. He has more than seven years of experience in processing, validating, and designing genotyping workflows, not only just for research, but also for clinical and forensic testing. He has co-authored the government proposal for the world's largest genotyping project called the Milli Milli Millennium Veteran Program, which is now in its fifth year. He currently focuses in designing and implementing genotyping testings for both clinical and consumer companies. He works on microarray-based cytogenetic testings and quality management systems. His design has led to obtain multiple CLIA licenses throughout the United States. The title of the talk is Clinical and Consumer Applications Using Microarrays and Other Genotyping Technologies. Please welcome Alexander Axt to the podium. Excellent, excellent. Uh, I am honored to be here today to be uh, working with Dennis over the last two years and for him to invite me out here to talk about this. Uh, I'm young in my career, but I've been thrown in the middle of the epicenter for microarray testing uh, all around the world and I've been working with so many wonderful companies. And so we're gonna take a left-hand turn here. I'm not gonna talk about mycotoxins or glutathione, um, but we're going to, I'm gonna relate it to the industry. So the industry is constantly changing. Uh, there's 23andMe, there's Ancestry, there's all these brand new companies out there with at-home tests. There's at-home tests being um, sold right here at this conference. They're coming. Millions of people are doing these tests. They are using these technologies in droves. Tens of millions of people are doing this every day. And at some point, they're gonna walk through your door as the doctor and go, I got this genetic information from this company. What does it mean? How are you gonna respond to that? So I kind of want to go through, this is going to be more, um, more informational about what the current instruments are, how they work, what are the technologies that everyone's using, what are the applications behind it. Um, and I'm just going to go through the motions. So I'm going to do a quick introduction about myself. Who am I? Uh, Genotyping 101, I will say, I am impressed by how genetic literate everyone is here today. You don't know how many researchers and doctors I talk to on a daily basis that go, I have samples. I want to do a genetic study. What do I do? They have no idea where to start with any of this. So I am quite impressed. Every single talk here has had a genetic component. I see you guys are on the ball <laughs> with, uh, with all the new technologies out there. So hopefully I'm not boring everyone in the room. And uh, for those of you who don't know about these technologies and how they work, I hope this is educational and you learn what all these companies are currently using today. Um, go through the uh, technologies, go through the applications, and then I'm gonna dive into the consumer market uh, there's about a hundred companies out there selling DNA in a box. You know where these online? Tons of companies, all kinds of different reasons for ordering their test. And I'm going to go through that. Um, I'm going to talk about the good, the bad, and what you should do if your patient walks to the door with that piece of paper from company ABC saying, I have all this genetic information, what do I do? Is this clinically relevant? So who am I? Um, eight years, I actually just had my anniversary with the company. I, I've been processing microarrays since day one as a lab manager and now as, in business development. Uh, I'm a lab rat at heart. I like being in the lab, I like processing samples. Um, so currently over 500,000 samples. Next year we're on par to do a million samples just next year. 
That is how quickly this field has grown in a matter of five, six years. Uh, I've clinically, I clinically validated the first cytogenetics test on a microarray, and actually I had good news a few weeks ago. I am a co-author on a paper where we were successful in submitting microarray data for a criminal trial. We, wow. we, we beat out the, the, the Golden State Bridge Killer, I, I, I forget the exact name of it, but uh, we were the first to use a microarray technology to be admissible in court. Um, so really excited about that paper coming out, which I have to work on on the airport when I leave here. So uh, currently I'm working with dozens of consumer companies and that's what I'm gonna dive into. So genotyping. Everyone in here knows what genotyping is. Process of determining which genetic variants an individual possesses. Your ATCGs, are you heterozygous, are you homozygous? Uh, most common form of it is SNP genotyping, single nucleotide polymorphism. We've all discussed this. Uh, it's a single base pair mutation at a specific location, and you usually have only two alleles. There are exceptions to the rule. Uh, there's currently over 335 million SNPs in databases out there today. Only about 15 million are relevant. The other 310 million, people haven't researched in depth yet. But there's millions of them in your genome. They make you special and unique. So, what is happening in the literature? The bottom line is genotyping. It has remained flat for the past 10 years. Uh, the other line, you see sequencing, has gone, taken off exponentially. Why is that? They both come down in price. They're both very useful technologies. So I'll tell you a story after I talk about the next one or two slides. Since 2005, we have gone from the microarray costing about $1,500 per sample it's now below 50, and I actually know of some technologies you can do under $10. $10. You can get hundreds of thousands of data points for under $10. It's amazing. Um, oh. Whole genome sequencing. 10 years ago, $10 million. What? A few weeks to get your data. It was a long, expensive process. Uh, with the help of current technologies from Thermo, Illumina, Roche, they have brought it below $1,000. And as we just heard, you can get it for about 800, 900, a whole genome sequence, 30X, but still not cost effective in the consumer market. Most people will not shell out $1,000 to get their genome whole sequence. I've been thinking about it because <laughs> I want to know. But, but the everyday consumer will not shell out $1,000. So microarrays in a sequencing world, why are they still relevant? SNP genotyping has been around for 40 years. It's not a new technology. It's very old technology. But it's mature. It's very mature. And it comes in at an extremely low cost. And this is why, and as I'll go into, the consumer market has jumped onto this technology. So when I say mature, these markers have been thoroughly studied and validated, and there's a lot of literature to back up each of these markers. And that's very important for microarrays. Microarrays are not for finding new technology or, or new novel markers out. You can, but that's not the point of them. They're validated, consistent data markers that can be reproduced time and time again to get the same exact data. And that's why they're valuable. They are consistent in the data that they give. Now, you can now cover millions of markers in a single assay. So I brought some props 
So for those of you that have not been in a lab and you haven't seen these technologies out, uh, some of your tables have a microarray sitting on it. This is one of the most common ones from Illumina, and there's their competitor is Affymetrics, and I only have one for Affymetrics, so I'll pass this one around, which they do it in a plate format. They have little tiny pegs. Um, most of the arrays that you're holding, this one is every little one of those squares, five million markers. <laughs> Some of them you have have eight samples, four samples, 24 samples. They come in different variations. Uh, they range from about 50,000 markers to about five and a half million, which is I have one of the five million ones right here. So again, they're highly accurate. They have a high reproducibility. And they come in small data sets. From the previous talk, one terabyte, it's gone up since then. The new sequencer, it's three terabytes per whole genome sequence. Three terabytes. That'll fill up your computer at home. The bioinformatics processing power has to be exponential at this point to handle that kind of data for whole genome sequencing. Microarrays pump out a few megabytes. It's a text file. It's very easy to manipulate, to view, to understand. You don't need a whole lot of computing power to do microarray analysis. And it's easier analysis. Genotyping is basically binary. You're getting your alleles, what are you, A, T, C, G, on this marker. Very easy, very straightforward. You can look it up, you can research it. And these arrays are used for a wide number of applications. You have your everyday SNP genotyping. You can do copy number variation, gene expression. There is now a microbiome array. Unfortunately, I didn't put a slide up there that would be very relevant to this group right here. There's a uh, microbiome array that looks at uh, all the uh, species in the microbiome, uh, fungus, protozoa, and a few other viruses. Um, uh, so these technologies are ever evolving. And of course, methylation. And um, methylation is extremely important. We actually run one of the world's largest methylation studies as well. So technology, you have your standard everyday real-time PCR, and you have microarrays. Two biggest ones on the market today. And some of you have these on your desk. That's um, just more pictures of what they look like. So everyone knows what PCR does. You have a DNA strand, it's denatured, the primer is attached. Uh, the strand is replicated and a floor four gets released, and the microarray scanner picks up on that. And that's it, that's it. We've been doing the same thing for 30, 40 years. It's the whole process right there. And then it tells you what your marker is on that probe. But the technologies have been ever evolving. So, this guy, and the big part of this is that I'm going to be talking about all these instruments. Um, this guy is the ABI 7900. Workhorse, some of you may have used this in your labs. You may still have one in a closet somewhere. Um, it, it is a workhorse, standard real-time PCR instrument, um, 96 well plates, 384 well plates. Um, it was great. It's great. Ours just died. We had to put it out to pasture. It's a very sad day. The owner was very upset. Um, it's been around <laughs> uh, with him for 20 years. Um, but the new ones now have just wonderful multiplexing options. So, this guy right here is your Fluidyme. Fluidyme makes one that has a bunch of capillaries. So each one of those is spot to put your sample on one side and your primers on the other side. So instead of doing one probe for one sample, one at a time, this is a network of small capillaries that intertwine between each other. And the probes cross with the sample, and you can usually do about 24 to 96 markers and pump out that data two, three hours. This guy is the new one of this one. This is the Thermo Fisher um, open array system, 
And this is the new workhorse that most of these clinical labs have today. They probably have one of these instruments in-house. Uh, these can do about 384 samples, and you can multiplex about 96 probes at a time in a single well. So the dyes have gotten more advanced. It's one sample, one well, 96 dyes, 96 uh, probes. Again, two hours, you have 96 data points. Um, and they're very cost effective. Each one of these is under $100,000 today. And they pump out hundreds of thousands of samples a year. So they're very cost effective. So microarrays. What are the basic principles of the DNA microarray? The array contains immobilized allele-specific oligonucleotides. Affymetrics, alumina, they're the same thing. I'll pass around the plate. It's the same exact concept for both. Then fragmented DNA is targeted, labeled with fluorescent dyes. And then you have a detection system, which is the microarray unit at the very end. So each has their own box. So again, just to quickly repeat myself, the probes are fixed to a solid surface, which are what you have in your hand. They're physically attached to the surface. There's millions of them. Uh, low end, you can get one at 1,000 probes, but that's not common anymore. Go up to 5 million. Uh, the cost between 20 to $300 on the higher end. Uh, applications are diverse again. Gene expression, methylation, CNV, microarray, there's pharmacogenetics. Uh, you can do ta targeted panels, GWAS, ethnicity, ancestry, uh, quite a number of things on these. Now there's over 200 off-the-shelf products today between Illumina and Affymetrics. You can get them, whatever flavor of research you're looking for, they have it for you. And if they don't, they'll create it for you. So how are they made? Illumina, which is the one I'll bring up first, has a silicon wafer and a photoresistant layer, and they are plasma etched uh, into, they open up the well a little bit deeper. So they have beads that have the oligonucleotides attached to them, and they just lay them over the top. And that's it. They get, a, they get fixed to those wells, as you can see right there. They're not blue. The, they, they just did that for the picture. Um, and they are spaced about six microns apart. Very, very close. Hmm? One well. One well. So each one, of these, each one of these beads have thousands and thousands of copies of that one oligonucleotide. So you have a high redundancy for each probe that you're looking for, each marker that you're looking for, which makes them very valuable. And if you think about it, for $20, 30 $40, you're getting about 10 to 50,000 data points for a dollar. Now, researchers have moved on from microarrays. Um, sequencing is the new sexy thing out there. Everyone wants to do some type of se sequencing. Whole genome, exome, transcriptome, targeted panels, de novo, 16S, 18S, shotgun metagenomics. Whatever you do in your research, there, there's a flavor of sequencing for you, and it's getting a lot cheaper every day. One of the reasons researchers have moved on is because they get penalized when they write grant applications. I was talking to a senior scientist at one of these manufacturers, and he was talking to a grant reviewer. And he goes, I penalize everyone that puts down microarrays. It's an old technology. So he went through all these points that I've just pointed out, how useful they are. They're cheap, efficient, accurate. They have a high reproducibility. He went through the whole sales pitch. And he goes, I mean, are you going to continue to penalize these people? I mean, it's a great technology. He goes, it is. I, I am going to penalize them. It's an old technology. Uh, there's, nothing, <laughs> there's nothing we can do about that. People have their opinions about the technology because it's been around a while. 
Um, sequencing is great, but it has its, its faults and it has its barriers. Um, so this is why the consumer market is taking this on. So again, you have a unique oligo for each bead type. Bead pools are over a million. They lay it across. They're randomly assembled. And you have about 15 to 30 beads. So not only do you have thousands of copies on the beads, you have 15 to 30 of those beads out there for a high amount of redundancy on, on the array itself. Now the other company, Affymetrics, which is this guy, and I'll pass this around. It's, a, it's another take on the same thing. Here. I'll give this to Shalini so you can touch it. You can take them out. I, I wash them with ethanol. They're not going to hurt you. They're completely worthless at this point. So photolithography uses a slightly different way of making the same roughly the same thing as alumina. So the UV light is passed through a lithographic mask that asks, acts as a filter, and it helps either transmit or block the light, and it removes, sorry, lost my place. It removes that layer, and, as they, and it will build one nucleotide at a time. These are about 30 to 50 mer long, so you have an average of four plates for each layer each nucleotide layer that they're adding, and it'll have between 120 and 150 uh, masks. Um, the difference between the technologies is alumina is randomly ex uh, assembled. They just wash the beads over, they scan it, they tell you where everything is, you get a bead pool manifest, which gives you the address of every single bead on the array. Affymetrics, which is the small 96 well plate you're you're passing around. This uses the masks, which guarantees that that probe is in the same place every single time. So when you order one or you get a custom one, you, they have a series of masks for that specific array. That probe will be in the same location 100% of the time. It's not randomly assembled. So uh, not being random. So they're they're fixed in the same position on the silicone wafer. Fixed. Yes. The contracts are random. Yes. So why is the consumer market really taking on the microarrays day in and day out? Because it's high throughput. It's cheap, and you can do millions and millions of samples a year. Each one has their own automation. Each one has their own scanner. So all of them have the same general basic principle. You start with your genomic DNA, your cDNA. Uh, this is Affymetrix up here. This is Illumina. Affymetrix has partnered with Beckman and Nimbus. So you'll see some of these liquid handlers in the lab. Uh, they can do about 3,000 samples a day. Um, and then this machine is the Gene Titan. You load up your array, you load up your, your, your washes, your stains, your extensions, and it does all the work for you, and then it will scan it, and then it will give you the output. Uh, Illumina is a little bit different. Uh, they pretty much have partnered with TCAN. Some of you may have a TCAN in your lab. They make lots of different liquid handling robots out there. Again, these can knock out probably 20, 30 plates a day, and this is their microarray scanner. This, this is just a scanner. This does none of the washing, none of the extension, um, none of the, none of the hands-on stuff. This is simply, you put this in this machine, it reads, it reads the, um, the intensity values off of those probes. So what is the workflow? It's standard about a four to five day workflow. Um, first day is DNA extraction, RNA extraction, CD, um, reverse transcriptase, whatever you're starting with. 
Uh, first day is DNA extraction. You do your QC. And then you get about 200 nanograms of DNA, and it goes right into the workflow. So you start off with you amplify, fragment, then you, there's a precipitation step missing, but then it's hybridized to the array, it's labeled with the nucleotides, and then they're removed, and then they're stained, and it's imaged, and that's where you get your, your data at the end. So I'm gonna go through these steps one at a time. Um, whole genome amplification, it's optimized for the whole genome, obviously. Uh, with whole genome amplification, you reduce the bias caused by PCR, which PCR is looking at a single locus in one area. So these are a random mix of primers and enzymes, and it, um, you, you put it in the sample, you put it in the oven at 37 degrees overnight, and it will do a thousand-fold amplification of the whole genome. Then the next day, you take it out of the oven and you fragment the sample. So the fragmentation step is random. It, um, it is endpoint, so there is a stopping point. Um, so it's not, it's not time sensitive once you add these enzymes into it. And you get about 300 to 600 fragment size at the end that will be attached to the probes on the beads themselves. Then after precipitation, which I'm jumping a step because I'll just get to the good part. Uh, hybridization is one of the most important parts. Uh, sample is hybridized directly to the array. So in the process, you'll add the DNA to the well, to the slide, to the 96 well, to the bead chip, however you're gonna do it. And it's gonna hybridize to that, that probe on the array. There's a complementary genetic sequence that binds to its probe set. And then a nine mer solution probe pairs a specific haptin to a specific base. Um, so your A's and T's are the red channel, your G's and C's are the green channel. Each company uses a different haptin to do its staining and its, uh, uh, and its fluorophore. <laughs> and then again, each probe set is replicated at least two times on the array and up to 15, even up to 30 times, depending on the array. So this is just a cross section of the hybridization. And this is on the Illumina array. Um, you can see the bead and the, and the probe right there. This is your DNA getting attached to it. So it will match up right here with the probe, and it'll be, um, and then it'll leave your SNP right there. So what happens? You do a single base extension. So your homozygous, heterozygous, homozygous, it'll, it'll be extended by one base pair, your ATCGs. and then the DNA will be washed away. And just to show you, so your DNA template goes, wa it gets washed away. You're left with that single nucleotide at the end of the probe. And what is happening is you have your haptin, your anti-haptin that goes on top of the haptin, and then your antibody haptin conjugate. And this is layered upon each other in, in a series of five stains. And looks like this. So start off with the haptin on the probe. Your anti-haptin tracks the anti-haptin conjugate, and it just builds upon itself one at a time. So again, it'll do this five times, and this just helps increase the intensity that, so the microarray can pick up on it at the end. And again, just another cutaway of what is actually happening on these probes. So. What do you have here at the end? What, what kind of data are you gonna have? You're gonna have intensity data. So it's gonna pick up in the green channel, it's gonna pick up whether it was a C or G, uh, the red channel, or your A's and T's, and if you have a mixture of it, your, 
your uh, heterozygous. So we'll have the intensity will be roughly the same for the green and red channel in the end. Again, what are these microarray readers? Uh, this is Thermo Fisher has bought up Affymetrix. That's what Thermo Fisher does. They buy the little guys. They don't create anything really novel anymore. Um, they buy up everyone else and just add them <laughs> to the catalog. Um, Affymetrix was a private company up until about two years ago. Uh, again, this is their Gene Titan. This is their microarray solution. And then this is the other half. This is Illumina. This is the eye scan unit. And this is a microarray, which you have on your table. So what can you do with it? Why is the consumer market so interested in these microarrays? Again, it's mature. You're not looking at anything novel. You're looking at information that we already know about. And that's what the consumer market wants. They want consistent, reliable information time and time again. They don't want to do de novo sequencing. They're not in the realm of doing research. They want a marker. They want an output. They want to know what that nucleotide is. Is it A, T, C, G? And how does that relate to the literature? And they're not the only ones. The microbiome is growing every day. I know of a dozen microbiome companies today that you, they will collect your stool sample. They will give you a readout doing 16S, uh, 18S. Uh, there's even fungal panels out there for ITS. Uh, the biggest one is Ubiome second genome, there's a few other major players out there. So not only are people doing your swab spit kits that everyone knows and, 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 and does, um, people are doing stool samples. And, and they're doing a lot of them. They're doing a lot of them. I, I know one company that has 27 sequencers full, day in and day out. And each time you run it, you can do 384 samples. So there's tens of thousands of people out there doing this test today. And what, what good is this to the patient? They're going to get this report, and they're going to come to you and go, well, this is my microbiome profile. What do I do about it? Do I take a probiotic? <laughs> do I stop taking a drug? Is this drug decreasing my biodiversity in my gut? And these are the questions that are going to be posed to you as clinicians. Another big one that's coming, coming to the forefront is forensic. There are several companies trying to validate uh, a number of arrays today that I know of. Um, I obviously was involved with one that I just brought up, um, but there are a few of their competitors. So what the forensic side of things is doing, there's some really novel, interesting technologies out there on the forensic side. Um, most of them are positioning themselves for cold cases where they have lost leads. These cases are 20, 30 years old. They get old, fragmented DNA, just degraded, um, just terrible, terrible DNA. They found, I found a femur in the woods. It's covered in mold, bacteria. And so they come to people like myself, and there's other companies that do this. Um, and we do the DNA extraction, then we put them on a microarray. So, what, what they're selling is their algorithm. And what their algorithm is, they're trying to look at phenotypic, uh, they're trying to take your DNA and make a phenotypic profile of you. What do you look like from your DNA? And it's very accurate. Um, to date, we have, we have six, six cases that were solved and about two dozen more from this, uh, that are in the courts right now from 20-year-old cases, because they said, you're looking at the wrong guy. He looks like this. And they're like, that's the nephew. That's the neighbor. That's the, that's the distant uncle. And it is highly accurate. It's getting better every day. Um, so just a few others. You can do quality <laughs> assurance. The big biobanks out there, there's an array called the fingerprinting array. There's a biobank array which just gives you HLA, it just gives you common ancestry, GWAS markers, uh, QTLs, uh, CNV, just stuff that you can have in your biobank to reference back to that this sample has these markers associated with it. 
And then they'll go out and sell these to pharma and say, well, these are the samples you're looking for that have these markers. Uh, go ahead and do your, your clinical trial. Um, and I see a lot of this. Um, and that kind of ties in right there with biobanking. Agriculture. Uh, the two big ones, Monsanto, Syngenta, they are some of the biggest buyers of microarrays out there to date. They run millions and millions of samples every year on 20 plus crops. They're doing corn, soy, wheat, day in and day out, thousands a day. They have their own custom arrays. I, I know this through word of mouth because they're that big. They've developed their own system to do all this reporting. Uh, your food is very well researched and very well tested. Um, and it's only growing. I, I get inquiries all the time about agricultural. It's not what we specialize in, so we usually pass up on a lot of that, but, but it is very interesting. Um, they are making better plants, they are making better foods, and they are doing, <laughs> I see some people shaking their, their, their heads. It's all genetically modified at this point, I'm sorry. <laughs> GMOs are okay, it's fine, it's fine. I've been selectively breeding crops for for hundreds of years. And you don't understand your Okay. Well, they use on the crops. Let's wait till the end so we can all hear. I have a. Because I got hearing aids and I can't hear until you speak under the curtain. I. I see I hit a nerve. Um, <laughs> and the big one are these two, direct to consumer. And that is getting directly related into medicine. So personalization. Coca-Cola was looking at a genetic test years ago. You will have personalized, there will be tests to sell you personalized items. It's coming. Uh, 23andMe and Lexus did a April Fool's commercial. I don't know if you saw that, where they said, take your 23andMe data and we will send you a personalized Lexus based on your DNA. I, I wish I would have added it to the slide set. Um, <laughs> it's very interesting. Uh, it, it, is, it was a joke, but they said, well, based on these markers, this is the type of chair you should sit in. Um, based on these markers that deal with caffeine, um, this is the size cup holder you should have in your car. Based on these markers for eyesight, this is the type of windshield we should install in your car. Now, it sounds funny. It sounds like a very distant future kind of thing, but it's right around the corner. The cosmetic market is doing this today. They will sell you personalized lotions and, and makeup based on your genetic makeup. I know of at least a dozen companies, big and small, that are doing this today. They will sell you a kit, they will sell you a, a face wash, uh, moisturizing regimen, right out of the box. So, where are we with consumer genetics? It has grown exponentially. Last year, over 7 million tests were bought. The public went out and bought 7 million of these box kits, and that is just for these few companies. There's 100 more out there doing this exact test, and they're doing it on these two arrays that are being passed around the room. Not these two specifically, but the same exact technology. So almost no one took these tests. And you can see 2017, over 7 million people, just in the United States, just for these few tests. And you know, I've, I've, I've talked about this slide with other people, and we think, I, I know we've made jokes about millennials in here. Uh, as the only millennial in here, um, we're in our 30s now. We have houses and kids and stuff. You're talking about Generation Z. <laughs> the, the, kid bought, uh, the kid born in 1999, 2000, he is an adult, and he fully accepts this technology today. They have turned 18 right here. 
They're buying these kits for themselves, for their families, for grandma and grandpa, for dad and mom, to figure out more about themselves, more about their ancestry, more about their background. They have grown up with the human genome sequence. It is in all the textbooks from elementary to high school now. They are fully accepting of doing these tests. And they will go out there and they will spend money and they will have these reports and they will make lifestyle decisions based on this data. And again, this is just one more, kind of breaks it down a little bit more just between Ancestry and 23andMe. They both took almost a decade to get to a million users. And here is a crazy fact, is that on Black Friday, um, Ancestry sold 1.5 million kits one day. They sold 1.5 million kits just on Amazon. And uh, 23andMe does not release those, no, those numbers, but, but Ancestry came in third. So we can assume in one day, three million people went out and bought this kit. And they are getting information from these companies today. And they are, they are going behind their doctors and getting all of this information. So what do you do with it? So, in one final slide, globally today, it's two to seven billion dollars. 80 million new users per year, willing to spend 60 to about 100 dollars on a test. I know a lot of these tests go a little bit higher, they go 200, I've seen some as high as 400. I've seen a personalized one in China uh, go for as high as 1200 dollars for the test. And they, what they're selling you is not the test, they're selling you a product right behind the test, which is either a meal plan, a regimen, um, nutritional supplements, an exercise program, a face wash. There's all kinds of different things they're trying to sell you through these tests. And so, 80 million new users in the world. Uh, you, the United States is uh, first to market. We have the most users out there. Uh, the Europe is right behind us. They, they have, uh, there's probably a few dozen companies over in Europe doing this, but I will say the biggest markets coming out today is Mexico, Brazil, and Asia. And I will tell you, most of those markets don't care about ancestry, but they do care about athletics, they care about health, they care about a number of other things other than ancestry. Ancestry, I, I've come to find out, is a very American thing. Uh, we like to know where we came from. We're all immigrants. No one, none of our ancestors were born here, unless you're Native American. Um, so we like our ancestry kits, and we buy them in droves. Uh, the European market, to a little degree, the um, rest of the world doesn't really seem to care. And it's going to grow. It's going to grow. It's going to be $10, 20000000000 billion in the coming years. So what are they collecting? Blood, I get very little blood, uh, but 90% of it is these two right here. You get swab kits, you get saliva kits. Uh, people are going in, just swabbing their mouth and sending them in an envelope. Um, I will say the public screws this up in novel ways, and they have not ceased to amaze me on how they cannot collect their own sample at home. So this is one of my biggest worries. Um, and I'll just tell you a quick story. So um, uh, we process a lot of stool as well. And we had someone send a sample in a coffee tin. <laughs> um, apparently, they didn't read the directions. I don't know what, where the failure was, how they didn't read the report. Um, <laughs> but it was. Uh, um, it's a story that goes around the lab today. Um, but, but people are doing their own collections. And this is one of, the, one of the challenges to this testing. It's the first challenge is you're handing someone that knows absolutely nothing about genetics, collecting samples, and you are relying on them to do it accurately. 
<laughs> which is sometimes really hard for some of them. Um, there's only five steps in the process. It's swab your mouth, put it in a bag, put it in your mailbox. Uh, but again, they find novel ways of completely ignoring everything in those instructions. Um, we, of course, know urine, like some of the tests here today. <laughs> um, and a big one that um, I find pathologists um, is that they have all these FFPE slides. They don't know what to do. They've been in storage for 10, 20 years, and they hold such large amounts of data, and they're perfect for microarrays. So we have extraction processes. Uh, we, have uh, we have protocols in place to rebuild the DNA samples to make them useful again. And pathologists are digging in their basements and going, ah, oh, those cases from 20, 30 years ago. And they're sending these slides. And we're doing them on methylation studies. We're doing them on GWAS studies. We're doing RNA. We're doing a whole bunch of novel things with them. So we're taking old, possibly useful samples and actually getting useful DNA out of them. Uh, one of the issues, because we talk, talk, talking about mold, is that some of them don't store them very right, and they grow mold. Um, we've had slides come in a little, little, little gross, um, and you, you know these pathologists don't worry about it. They go into some, some hospital basement for 20, 30 years. So what are some of the arrays out there? There is a array called the direct-to-consumer array. It's based on a consortium of different companies, um, and they vary from um, just forensics, ancestry, GWAS, nutrition. Um, we're doing athletics. There's a number of different things on the array. So there's custom arrays out there for the everyday client. Uh, the everyday client for in the consumer market doesn't want a whole array. They are looking at 20 markers, 50 markers, 200 markers, 2,000. They don't want 900,000. But this is what these arrays produce at a very, very low cost. And they're using this data to mine for other useful markers later on after getting all of this data. So the DTC array, uh, it uses a backbone of the precision medicine array, which is one that has a lot of clinically relevant variants on it, uh, 900,000 SNPs. And 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 that's about it. So make, read my notes. Um, clinical application. There is a dementia array that is clinically verified today. It looks at Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease. It has about 130,000 markers on it. Uh, very useful. It's growing in popularity. Um, and people use this to um, look at their risk for Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases, such as dementia. So where is this going? Pharmacogenetics. It's uh, precision pharmacogenetics. You'll see PGX out there. Uh, enables a clinician to provide a patient with optimized treatment for maximizing drug uh, efficacy and maximizing adverse events. There's over 300 currently on the FDA approved medications and it is growing every day. Um, and I'll dive into that ever so slightly. Um, so the FDA approved medications, about 7% of them are affected by these PGX markers. And the number of people affected is about 18%. So and that shows the prescriptions in the United States, where about 18% could be affected by these PGX markers. So PGX testing and personalized medicine, you keep hearing it. What is personalized medicine? What is PGX testing? It is drug exposure and clinical response variability those that do and do not respond to a drug. There is a genetic component behind it. There can be. So PGX testing is out there today. There are a number of companies that have clinically validated a number of these markers. They will run these panels either on standard genotyping plates, and there are several arrays out there that cover the gauntlet of PGX markers today. Um, it is for a risk risk for adverse events, um, and it helps 
you diagnose what kind of dosage people can tolerate. So there's variations. Um, it has genotype-specific dosing for optimization of a patient's dosing. And some of the examples is, uh, you know, uh, CYP2D6, which is cytochrome P450. A number of people have brought that up in these conversations. Uh, the 2D6 is the big one. It affects probably 25% of the drugs on the FDA list. Uh, BRAF, which is uh, BRAF, codes a protein, uh, controls cell growth, and is shown to be faulty and mutated in a number of human cancers out there. It's one of the big ones. And EGFR, and it, has, it is a receptor for members of the epidermal growth factor family um, associated with Alzheimer's, and its uh, overexpression is associated with a number of tumors. And if you want to see the full list, which I encourage all doctors to look at, you can click on the slide right there. That is the official FDA approved list of all PGX markers out there today. So, standard, so what are the solutions? I kind of dived into it. You can do standard TACMAN genotyping. You can do these probes today. They're available. Uh, They're cheap. You can look at one or two variations very cheaply. Uh, there are two arrays out there today, and I'm just going to say this is not one of their arrays. This is the open array for that other system I was talking about. Uh, a number of PGX panels have been adapted to this technology to look at about 96 of the PGX markers of interest uh, immediately into one well. Um, but the two on the market today that uh, everyone seems to really love from the two companies that I've mentioned is the PharmacoScan array, and it looks at 4,600 absorption, di distribution, metabolism, and excretion genetic markers for 1,191 genes. And Illumina, uh, some of you actually might have the GSA in your hand. We run tens of thousands of these arrays. It's the most popular one. Um, it's about 13,000 of these markers, and in total looks at about 700,000 markers. So, um, so both of these are very, very popular for microarray testing today. You can look at a wide variety of genes, and you can look at a wide variety of the PGX markers for these genes. So challenges to the market, logistics and quality assurance. I'll just combine these two. Again, you are trusting the public to do what's right. You are trusting a private company to interpret the literature and to report accurate information. Um, and there's challenges to that because there's a lot of these companies out here, they're grabbing information from this database, this PubMed article. Um, so I encourage you as doctors to, um, if someone hands you one of these reports. Look at the company, look to see if they have a scientific board, uh, look to see if they have a reputable board, um, and look to see if, the, if there's science to back up their claims. Um, there is snake oil out there. Uh, I've seen a couple of those companies come and go. Um, I, I ask you to, to question what you're handed, if you're handed it. Uh, I, but I, I, I ask you not to dismiss it. There is, there is science to back up a lot of this. Now, is it a binary yes or no answer? No. It's a, there, there's a spectrum. Um, and again, going into reporting, it's unique for every company. That's what they sell. These companies are selling algorithms that they came up with themselves. So. Be, be diligent um, and, and just be smart about it if you're handed these reports or if you go out and have a genetic test done. So what should clinicians do? Work with the reporting company. A lot of these tests are not clinically validated. People are going around their doctors. They are getting a lot of novel information, and they will come to you and say, should I be taking vitamin B? Should I be taking vitamin C? Should I be taking this drug? Should I be exercising more? This says I shouldn't be drinking coffee. They may come and bother you with all these questions, and they're going to maybe hand you someone's report. So I encourage you, 
if you don't know what the report says or if you don't understand it, work with the company first. Um, and the future is seek out a genetic counselor. There's a whole org There's a whole organization of people out there that are trained and they specialize in talking with patients about their genetic data and reports. They can go to these people. Um, they're usually consultants. Uh, there's a few groups out there that do this and the patient can go to them and they can go through each gene, each variant and do the research for you and, and take that burden off of your shoulders and trying to understand the entire gauntlet of genetics. Um, they'll spend the time with them. So if you're interested, as a doctor, there is the National Society of Genetic Counselors. You can reach out to them, find one in your local area, and, and again, take this burden off of your shoulders. I don't know if anyone's in here is a PhD in genetics. I am certainly not. Uh, I am not a doctor either. <laughs> so I would default to these people if someone came to me with a, a lot of specific questions uh, in this arena. So what is, where's the trend going? And this is just a, a, a wonderful graphic that I like to use. Um, about 30,000 patients will be, and this is sequencing, so I'm switching up a little bit. About 30,000 patients will be sequenced this year. It's gonna grow potentially up to 36 million by 2030 and you may be doing as high as 83 million for people with rare disease diagnostics. Sequencing, microarrays, and whole genome sequencing isn't going anywhere. People are gonna get these terabytes. They're gonna get little thumb drives with one to three terabytes of information. They're gonna take it to a bioinformatics person or a private company. They're gonna have a report spit it out, and then they're gonna come bother you <laughs> with a lot of information. Uh, it's almost too much information. Um, so it's coming. I'm, I'm here to warn you. It's, it's at our doorsteps. It is growing and growing and growing exponentially. Um, and you will be faced with a lot of tough questions. And, and the field is growing every single day. And I sit in an office and can read the white papers and try to keep up with this every single day. And there's a lot. There's a lot to digest in this field. So. Um, I just wanted to bring this up. Uh, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics recommend that all clinical laboratories look for these 56 genes in their findings. Uh, these are very clinically relevant genes. Uh, of course, BRCA1, BRCA2, uh, Lynch syndrome, and Wilson's disease. These are some of the big ones. Uh, these are very, well, breast cancer isn't very rare, but the other um, have, are slightly rare, and they encourage any of these companies that if they get a hit on any of these genes to let the patient know that these are very clinically relevant and there can be things done to help alleviate these symptoms or correct them. So I, I put the source down here. This is the full article. It'll go through all 56 uh, in great depth on, on the Nature paper. Um, and I encourage you to read that one. So, and what is happening in the world? There are a number of global initiatives. The US is usually number one in these. We, we, we like our big initiatives. There's the US uh, Million Veteran Program, which um, I'm slightly a part of. I am a small part of a much bigger consortium. Uh, the other one is the All of Us, which just came out. So some of you actually may have heard about this. This is, the, this is gonna be the largest genomic undertaking by the NIH ever. They are going to collect one million participants over the next few years, and they will have a microarray done on them for GWAS studies and for these ADME uh, markers, and they are, will have everyone whole genome sequenced. Um, I, I like to sign up for these different studies, so I have given my sample. Um, so hopefully in a year or two, I will get a little thumb drive of information <laughs> that I, I look forward to. Uh, but I encourage you, if you like signing up for these, uh, they're, they're looking for participants to give a few blood samples and take a questionnaire, and they will be following you for a while. But this is the largest initiative in the world today uh, that the NIH is pursuing. And then 
Some of our friends, uh, Australia, Genomics Health Alliance, they're doing, they're gathering a consortium together and they will be doing hundreds of thousands of samples here shortly. Then we have the UK Geno uh, Genomics of England. Uh, over 100,000 patients have been whole genome sequenced. Uh, it's a very useful database. It's referenced a lot out there um, today. So more and more patients are, are getting whole genome sequenced through these initiatives. And then, just a little fun fact, 10% of Finland's population has some form of genetic data. Now I go back to how many kits we were selling, or Ancestry and 23 and all these other companies. 10 million a year, that's uh, about 3% of the population every year will do a test. So we're growing and growing and growing. It's only a matter of time in 10, 15, 20 years where almost everybody in this country will have some form of genetic data on them. Get cheaper. <laughs> it's going to get cheaper. It's going to get faster. It's going to be more in your face every single day. And so, quick summary. Microarrays are an important tool for large-scale uh, genomic studies. They're still used today, just more in the private consumer market. Uh, the pricing is allowing investigators to consider novel large experiments. Uh, researchers every day going into the tens of thousands to possibly 100,000 in their, in their research studies. Um, next generation of Axiom and Infinium arrays in, enable innovative approaches. Uh, you're not just doing genotyping anymore. You can do CNV, you can do methylation, you can do transcriptome, you can do the microbiome. There's a lot of other arrays out there. They have specific uses and, they're, and they are, they're available to you today if you're interested. And quality, cost, turnaround time, crucial aspects and sure microarrays will continue to be a tool in genomics and precision medicine research for, the, for several years to come until sequencing's under $100. So, and then if you wanna contact me, contact me. I have my information. I'm happy to talk microarrays and genotyping with you anytime. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>